Scott Wright of DraftCountdown.com. It is his Christmas. This is the day the Draft Countdown has been waiting for for a full year. It is finally here. Scott, welcome back. How are you? Happy Draft Day to everybody. <laughs> Happy draft day to everybody, he says. Let's, uh, all right, let's, uh, take a look at the top here. Are you, Scott, as we are just hours away from the number one pick, are you convinced, as most people are, that the number one pick in the draft will be Jared Goff? Yes, and I'm convinced Carson Wentz from North Dakota State is going to be the number two pick. And then after that, there's not much else I, I'm wholly convinced about. Uh, I had to turn in my final mock draft, uh, late last night and uh, I'm sticking with that for better or worse now and this is always the the, the toughest time because I, I'm already locked in on the mock draft everything's written and I'm just waiting for some report that's going to come out that's going to make me <laughs> doubt something or it's going to screw everything up and, and ultimately I don't know that any mock drafts can be particularly accurate this year because I think we're going to see more trades in the top 10 especially in the back end of the top 10 that are really going to kind of throw everything into just uh, disarray and then it's uh, it, anybody's guess is what's going to happen before we get your opinions on Goff over Wentz or Wentz over Goff, I know you're a Paxton Lynch guy as well. Mm-hmm. Number three, do you believe that that pick will be made by the Chargers? I do. I think the market for trading down kind of dried up when those top when it became clear those top two quarterbacks were coming off the board, and and the Chargers are in a great spot. They essentially have the number one pick in this draft because they weren't going to take a quarterback anyway, so they can just take the best player on their board. And whether that's uh, Laramie Tunsil, the offensive tackle from Ole Miss, personally, I went with Jalen Ramsey, the defensive back from Florida State, in that spot, but. I could see them going to Forrest Buckner from Oregon. So so they got a few options, but to me, it's, it's a Tunsil versus Ramsey decision just in terms of, of the pure talent. And, and I think they lean towards Ramsey. Scott, well, you mentioned those reports in my mock draft came out two days ago, so already I've got uh, 13 reports messing it up. But one of them <laughs> is Ronnie Stanley, and the Chargers love him so much that he might be in play number three. Uh, can you see that? And... Obviously, we have to talk about Miles Jack because he even intimated that microfracture surgery might be on the table. If that's the case, how far does he fall? Yeah, and Ronnie Stanley, and there's been talk throughout the process that there's some teams actually did prefer him to Laramie Tunsil. I think he might be a target more so in a trade down. and. And the Tennessee Titans were strongly linked to, to Stanley as well if they were going to move down. So I wouldn't be shocked to see the Titans come back up for Hunsell, Stanley, or Jack Conklin, the offensive tackle from Michigan State. But uh, I think Stanley's going to be a top eight pick, uh, probably somewhere in that six, seven, eight range. Uh, and, and, and I think people are going to come after him. Uh, as far as Miles Jack goes, I went with him at number five overall to the Jacksonville Jaguars. I just think that's exactly the type of player and difference maker they need, especially on defense. And the concern isn't about his immediate health. His, his, his ability to play this, this season isn't in question. It's more about three, four, five years from now. But if you're Gus Bradley, you might not have a job three, four, five years from now. So uh, I think you're gonna take the, they're going to take the best player. And, and I guess the reason I'm, I was comfortable doing that is because less than two weeks ago, their general manager and head coach flew across the country to L.A. to work out Miles Jack. And if, if their doctors had kind of ruled him out, I can't imagine they would have – Expend, expend those types of resources in terms of their time to make that trip. So uh, I just think he makes so much sense for them. And, and there is talk that he could slide, and, and we just don't know what type of advice these teams are getting from doctors. But uh, Miles Jack is my number three overall player in this entire draft, regardless of the position. And, and honestly, if not for the injury, he would have got my elite grade, which I'm, which I'm very stingy with. And I only gave two players this year, Tunsil and, uh, and Ramsey. So I, I really think highly of Miles Jack. And, He's exactly the type of linebacker that defenses need in this day and age where the league is so pass-happy. This is a guy who is built like a linebacker but runs like a defensive back. He can cover running backs, tight ends. Uh, you can put him out wide and he can cover wide outs. Uh, he's just uh, the ultimate chess piece. And uh, I have a hard time seeing him follow the top ten. And if he does, it will clearly be because of the health. Josh, it's uh, interesting for Eagles fans, you know, once they get past the number two pick, to start looking around and seeing what's going on, particularly with the Dallas Cowboys. What do you see them, and how do you ha- see them handling their draft pick? Because it was interesting for a while. It seemed like Ezekiel Elliott, when the Eagles were sitting at number eight, might be coming to Philly. Is he possibly going to Dallas? How do you see them handling that pick? 
he's in the mix there, and there's lots of reports that the Cowboys like him, and that's the high end of his range. Uh, I think he's going to go somewhere in that 4 to 13 range. And uh, it, it's fun to think about Elliott running behind a big, dominant Cowboys offensive line. There's no question he'd come in and he'd make a huge impact there. But at the same time, Barry Jones had plenty of opportunities the last couple of years to upgrade at running back, but he keeps going for uh, low-cost, cost-effective veterans like Darren McFadden. He just signed Alfred Morris, and and McFadden was pretty productive for them last year. So I just don't know if they see running back as a first-round priority, as good as Elliott is. uh, I think everyone kind of agrees on that. It's just a matter of whether it's worth taking a running back that early. But on the other side of the ball, where is the pass rush going to come from? for Dallas. I mean, for a team with Super Bowl aspirations, you need to be able to get after the quarterback. Greg Hardy, he was a distraction and a disappointment. He's probably not coming back. He hasn't been re-signed. Randy Gregory and Demarcus Lawrence are both going to be serving four-game suspensions. I almost think they're backed into having to take take Joey Bosa, the defensive end from Ohio State at that point, uh, who's a, a good player. I mean, that's a, a great fit in terms of both value and need, but uh, but I, I think uh, their, their pass rushers kind of back them into a corner and it might uh, force them to, to to go with Bosa, which which isn't a bad uh, scenario for them. I think that would be the right pick. So that's the way I went with my final mock draft. But if Jalen Ramsey is there, I think he'd probably be their preference. Scott Wright is with us, draftcountdown.com, for his final mock draft here on the NFL Draft Thursday. First round tonight, rounds two and three tomorrow. Scott, you know, let's look now at the top with these quarterbacks before we drop down into some other questions. You know, it will be Goff, you think, one. Wentz will be two. Are either one of these guys, in your opinion, worth the trade-up that the two franchises made to go get them? Do you view these two guys uh, as trade-up guys that, that, that you had to go get? I, I mean, if you were going to rank the top quarterback prospects over the last decade, would they be near the top? No, but, but they're good players. I think all three of these quarterbacks are legitimate top half of the first round, and uh, talents and my motto is it's impossible to overpay for a good starting quarterback. Now, if, if these guys end up busting for the Rams, the Eagles, and wherever Paxton Lynch ends up, of course it's going to be a huge mistake and it's going to haunt them and it's going to set them back years. But at least they're trying because they weren't getting where they wanted to go with Sam Bradford and Chase Daniel. They weren't getting where they wanted to go with Nick Foles and, and Casey Keenum. Uh, uh, I, I just think it's a move they had to make. Uh, and I think the real mistake would have been not making this type of trade and, and just relying on these veteran journeymen uh, with little or no upside and not giving yourself other options. Uh, so I, I applaud the moves by both the Rams and Eagles. And uh, and if they end up getting starting quarterbacks, it's going to be worth everything they, they paid uh, and then some. Now, Scott, we're, we're, we know the quarterbacks are going one and two. So what does that do to Paxton Lynch? Does that push him up the board a little bit uh, for quarterback desperate teams? And overall, how many signal callers do you have going in the first round? Is there a chance for Connor Cook or or maybe even uh, Christian Hackenberg if somebody likes what he was able to do at Penn State under Bill O'Brien back in the day? Yeah, and I'll start with uh, Christian Hackenberg. There's been reports that he could go as high as number 19 Buffalo Bills. And, and we've seen some pretty crazy stuff when it comes to the quarterback position in recent years, going back to Christian Ponder, EJ Manuel. But, but Hackenberg in round one would, would definitely take the cake because there's some ugly tape of him out there from the past couple of years. And there's no denying the potential he showed early on in his career, but I have a hard time seeing somebody invest in a first rounder on him. But I do think he's got a good chance to go at some point on day two. As for Paxton Lynch, he could conceivably come off the board as high as number eight overall for the Cleveland Browns. And if I were them, that's the direction I would be looking. Maybe they trade down a little bit, target him later. You've heard him link to the Saints. I'm not necessarily buying that. I think some of these teams are putting smoke screens out there trying to entice the New York Jets at number 20 to trade up. And of course, there were reports that the Jets were in the mix to trade up to number one or number two before uh, the Rams and Eagles made those deals, and, and they're not particularly uh, infatuated with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Uh, so I, I think Lynch would, would be a great fit for the Jets. And, and honestly, I might just stand pat if I'm the Jets because I think there's a good chance he might fall to me. The only team I'd be really worried about are the Browns and maybe the Bills. But uh, other than that, there aren't a lot of teams in that middle of the first round range that would be looking for a quarterback. Uh, but I do think we could see one other quarterback go in the first round. I only had three in my final mock draft, but I think somebody could trade up for Connor Cook. And, and keep in mind, 
that extra year on the rookie deal uh, for a first-round pick as opposed to a second-round pick, five years instead of four, that's significant when you're talking about a quarterback because it delays maybe having to give that player a huge extension uh, a year earlier than you would have to if everything works out well. Uh, and that last year on the contract, that might be a 20 or $25 million year if it turns into a good quarterback. Scott, you kind of alluded to it right off the top when you talked about uh, how you think there could be, particularly towards the end of the top ten, some more trades. Obviously, already one and two have been traded, um, the the first and second overall picks. Is is at the end of the day, is there a real potential that that could be the story of the first round, is just how many trades took place? Yeah, it really could. And, and I think the Tennessee Titans are going to move up into the top ten for a blocker. Uh, and they have all that extra ammunition now with those draft picks from the Rams. And, uh, and they, they could potentially move up as high as number six overall with Baltimore and get Laramie Tunsil from Ole Miss, who was the tackle most presumed they were going to take at number one. Uh, otherwise, they also really like Ronnie Stanley from Notre Dame or, or worst case, uh, Jack Conklin from Michigan State. So I think somewhere in that six to nine range, um, whether it's the Ravens, the Browns, or, or the Buccaneers, keep in mind that the Titans and Buccaneers front offices have a really close relationship. So uh, that, that might uh, 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 grease the wheels for a, a deal between those organizations. But uh, I think we're going to see three tackles in the top ten. Uh, and then the other wild card is the Cleveland Browns. I think they're open for business. and They want to stockpile as many picks as possible. And, and they're right at the back end of that top group of players. I think most teams feel there's there's about eight players in this draft, and then there's a drop-off. Well, they're picking at eight. So uh, if a team wants to come up and get the last of that group, the Browns are going to be uh, open for business. And uh, I think they're going to move down. So uh, I, I would say the Titans are going to move up, and the Browns are going to move down, and there might even be one more deal. Scott, uh, talk about this draft as a whole. What's the deepest position, uh, and what's the weakest position that if you're looking for help for, uh, you're not going to get it most likely? Definitely defensive tackle uh, is the strongest position. Uh, and, and just put in perspective, on average, about nine go in the top three rounds over the last decade. Uh, this year I've got 13 in that range, and you could probably make an argument for 15 or 16 guys. So um, defensive tackle, just incredible depth. Uh, in terms of the worst position, definitely tight end. Uh, this is not the year to be looking for a tight end. And uh, the, the top guy, Hunter Henry from Arkansas, is probably going to be a second off pick, but I don't even think he's as good of a prospect as Max Williams, who was the first tight end off the board last year and late round two to the Ravens. And, and, and not much in terms of depth either, especially when you get past the top four or five tight ends. You're basically looking at developmental projects or career backups. So um, the, the top tight end in the draft should have been O.J. Howard from Alabama, who opted to go back to school for his senior year. I think he would have been a first-round pick had he come out, which uh, really kind of hurt this class. But even with Howard included, that would have helped the class quality at the top, but um, the, the depth would have still been severely lacking. And, and it's been a bad tight end class for a couple of years now, really, but, but this one really takes the cake. Scott Rice with us, DraftCountdown.com, the NFL Draft tonight. You can listen to it on 97.3 ESPN. The coverage starts at 7 o'clock. Don't forget to watch us at 8 o'clock on our YouTube channel, Inside the War Room, with reaction to every pick. Scott, you know, um, every, we talk about the top of the two quarterbacks and what could happen there. Where are the wild card teams where a Paxton Lynch could go or a Connor Cook could go? Uh, we talked to somebody the other day, uh, Anthony Beck, who he has Connor Cook as his number one quarterback in this draft. So is he uh, a guy that you think could be a wild card? You know, where, uh, you know, the, the, the threshold for where that third quarterback could end up? Well, and I have to believe there's a quarterback that the Browns are higher on than most or that they really like. And it's a matter of, is it Lynch? Or is, it Car- is, it, uh, is it Cook? Is it Connor Cook? Or maybe it's someone else a little further down. It's Hackenberg. Maybe it's Cardell Jones from Ohio State. Uh, that's one of the most fascinating storylines of this draft is what are, is this new Browns regime going to be they coming over? from Major League Baseball, they're going to be analytics-based, and uh, what do they prioritize? I'm just fascinated by that. But uh, but I, I do think Cook, somebody might trade into the back end of the first round for him. If Cleveland doesn't take a lynch, I think they're, they're at number 32. I think they're a strong candidate to move to the back end of the first round. So, um, And then even further down, you look at the Dallas Cowboys, I think they're still motivated to get a, a long-term successor for Tony Romo. Uh, I've heard them linked to, to Hackenberg and Cardell Jones as well. 49ers, what are they going to do at quarterback? So so there's no shortage of teams 
need signal callers. And I think you're going to see quite a bit of action in the back end of the first round uh, with maybe one. And who knows? Maybe we even see five quarterbacks in the first round. Stranger things have absolutely happened at that position. And, uh, and uh, this is a good year to for those second tier quarterbacks. Not like last year where it just fell who off would be the? the you Minnesota. just said there could be Scott. You just said five possibly. You know, as a wild card, who would be the fifth? Cook, Wentz, Goff, Lynch. Who's number five? Well, the name I've heard mentioned most as a potential late first round pick is actually Hackenberg, and that would that would oh. absolutely surprise me. But uh, it it would uh, it, it wouldn't it would, you know it, the crazy things happen when it comes to quarterbacks. That position is very much beauty in the eye of the beholder, and and you know what? I wouldn't kill him for it if whoever did it, because uh, I, I'm never gonna criticize a team for at least trying at the quarterback position. Even if I don't agree with their evaluation of a player, even if they take him way earlier than they should, I'd rather see a team reach for a quarterback that they believe in and, and try to solve that problem once and for all than, than just spin their wheels with a, a veteran journeyman. Uh, so so uh, I, I just am a firm believer that nothing else matters in the NFL until you have a quarterback. So I applaud any team that's aggressive and, and goes after a guy. They, they might make mistakes, but Keep trying until you yeah. get it. Look at the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, they, they finally landed on Teddy Bridgewater. It, what if they would passed on Bridgewater because, oh, we had a bad experience with uh, Christian Ponder. We reached on him. We're not going to go quarterback again. You've got to keep trying. And once you get that quarterback, everything else falls hmm. into place. You know, it's interesting because I, I kind of said earlier today, Scott, you know, all these teams keep trying. It's like they're chasing this ghost that doesn't exist, this franchise quarterback. There's only a handful of them that do exist, and yet teams turn their franchises upside down trying to find this guy who doesn't really exist. You know, you, you seem like you luck into the franchise guy. You're either awful and the guy just happens to be Andrew Luck that year, or you luck into him. In other words, you got Tom Brady in the sixth round. You had no idea as a grander that, hey, he was going to be this guy. Russell Wilson comes to you in the third round. You know, you take a flyer on Drew Brees at the top of the second round, and he ends up working out. It seems that these teams go after this ghost of a franchise quarterback who doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, and there's no question. It, it's super risky, but that's why you have to keep trying if it doesn't work, too. Uh, I, 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 I compare it to a car. It's like putting all your money into a sound system and rims and a paint job and window tints <laughs> when you don't have an engine. Uh, you, you put the money in the engine, and then you figure out the rest. So, um, yeah, it's tough. I, quarterback's probably the, quarterback in the NFL is probably the hardest position in all sports to play uh, when you consider the physical demands, but and most importantly, the, the mental and, uh, and tangible demands. And uh, it's tough, but at the end of the day, it's all that matters. Scott, uh, last two years, we've had uh, a really good group of receivers come into this league. Obviously, this class isn't as highly regarded. I don't have my first receiver coming off the board till number 22, and then I think there's going to be a little bit of a run. What, what do you think of that receiving group this year? I totally agree with that. You don't have that elite stud at the top, but the sweet spot for value is going to be between 20 and 50. Uh, and, and I'm the same way as you. I have a, a run starting at number 22 with the Houston Texans. I have them taking Will Fuller from Notre Dame. Then I have the Vikings uh, with the following pick taking Laquan Treadwell from Ole Miss. Then the next pick, I have the Bengals taking Josh Doxson from TCU. And then a little later, I have the Chiefs taking Corey Coleman from Baylor. And, and even after those guys off the board, there's three, four or more that are going to go in the early to mid part of round two. So if you're looking for a wide out, the best place to be right this year is between 20 and, and 30. And, and that's where the value is. And uh, even in round two, Michael Thomas from Ohio State, who some people could end up being the best wide out to come out of this draft uh, down the line. I'm a huge fan of Braxton Miller from Ohio State. He's one of my personal favorite prospects in this class. So, um, yeah, and, and it's a good receiver class, but not only do you not have that elite talent at the top, but there's not quite as much depth either. I think you want, once you get outside the top 10 to 12 at that position, it drops off pretty severely. So um, if you're looking for a wide out, I don't know if this is the year to wait like it's been in the past. You're not going to find a Martavis Bryant in the fourth round this time around. You're going to have to make that investment relatively early if you're looking for an impact guy to come in and, and make that immediate contribution. Scott, uh, there have been some reports that the 49ers might be willing to trade Colin Kaepernick um, coming into this. How do you see the 49ers and our old good buddy there, Chip Kelly, handling some of uh, some of what's coming at them in this in his first draft here with the 49ers? Granted, I know he doesn't have the, the GM power that he said he never had in Philadelphia, but how do you think all that's going to shake out? And Do you think Colin Kaepernick will be his quarterback or not? It, it sure seems like the Niners and Kaepernick are heading for a divorce, and it's kind of a game of chicken right now between San Francisco and Denver. 
uh, and Kaepernick, where they're trying to figure out the trade details and, and to get Ka Kaepernick to rework his contract to, to make it a little more uh, feasible for the Broncos. So it, it seems like that makes too much sense not to happen, but, but they're definitely playing hardball with each other. And uh, I'm not sure what the Niners are going to do at quarterback, to be honest. And, and if, if we are working under the assumption that Kaepernick's not going to be in the picture, which I kind of am, I have to imagine there's a quarterback in this class that Chip Kelly likes. And I'll be interested to see who it is. And, you know, he's shown that he doesn't need necessarily a superstar quarterback to have a productive offense. His defense was Chip Kelly's undoing in Philadelphia for the most part. So I think he can scramble together a, an effective offense with whoever he brings in, even if it has to be Blaine Gabbert for the short term while they develop a young guy. But I, I guess I'll be surprised if, if uh, the Niners don't draft a quarterback at some point uh, this weekend. And, and if they don't, I think that's probably writing on the wall that, that they're going to stick by Kaepernick. Uh, Scott Wright, DraftCountdown.com. Uh, just for um, a good time here, where do you have – Wentz and Goff rated as opposed to where you had Bradford rated when he was coming out? Similar range, and I've actually compared Goff to like a Sam Bradford, Alex Smith level prospect. I'm not quite as high on him as some, but honestly, these three court, with these three quarterbacks, it's kind of splitting hairs, and I think it's, it's kind of a matter of, of preference. Uh, for me, my final overall rankings, I had Wentz 10, Lynch 11, and Goff 14. So they're all right there in the same group in, and and, and I think Goff makes the most sense for the Rams just because he's ready to come in and, and compete for that starting job right away and be the face of that franchise. Uh, and and also I think the fact that he's from California, he's a local hometown kid, he played as a co high school and college ball in the state, and, and they're going to have a lot more competition for those entertainment uh, dollars in the Los Angeles market. So I think that type of stuff played a role in this decision too, whereas with Wentz, ending up at Philly is the better situation for him. He'll have a little bit more time to uh, – uh, to, to develop and learn the playbook and adjust to the, the higher level of competition. So uh, I, I think it's, with the quarterbacks in the strategy, it's not necessarily just about the talent. It's about the other nuance uh, in the situations, uh, situ their respective situations. All right, uh, Scott, so we got Goff one. We got Wentz two. Uh, your mock draft has who at three? I went with Ramsey three to the Chargers, um, but I, I just – that's more of an educated guess than anything I, I feel really confident about. And you can make an argument for Buckner. You can make an argument for Tunsil. Uh, but I just think in terms of the talent, the value, the need, Ramsey makes the most sense. And if he doesn't go there, I think the Cowboys are going to snap him up at four. Uh, but if he's got a four, then I think the Cowboys come back with most and upgrade that pass rush. And then Jacksonville at five. I went with Jack there, although I've also heard DeForest Buckner would make some sense, and I've also heard Leonard Floyd, the outside linebacker from Georgia, which would surprise me a little bit. I would not be a fan of that choice, but that's something to kind of keep an eye on for the Jaguars, but they need a difference maker on defense. Uh, and let's go to 10 with the Giants. Who's going to New York? Well, I have uh, I actually have Leonard Floyd, the outside linebacker from Georgia, going to the Giants, and and I think he he's a guy they've been strongly linked to. He fills a need as a guy who can play both defense and outside linebacker. Maybe reminds that organization a little bit of a, a Matthias Suanuka type of player, and and he could uh, be effective in that type of role. If he's gone, uh, I think they audible to Jack Conklin, the offensive tackle from Michigan State. Maybe they take a look at Vernon Hargraves the third, the cornerback from Florida. But the Giants, are, they're kind of a tough team to get a read on. But I think if Floyd is there. He's the guy that they're zeroed in on. All right, Scott Wright, DraftCountdown.com for the final mock draft. And, of course, tonight at 7 o'clock, the draft here on 97.3. All right, Scott, uh, happy draft day to you, pal. Happy draft day to you, too, guys. Have fun. At Draft Countdown on Twitter for Scott's coverage tonight.